The thing I will be talking about today is a joint work with uh, Radoslav Adamczak from the University of Warsaw. Okay, so uh, the, the thing is maybe a little bit uh, off topic for this conference, uh, conference. However, it has definitely some, some functional inequality, inequality some uh, flavor. Maybe there is less about the discrete spaces, but these will also come up uh, by the end of the talk at some moment. Okay, so let's begin with something uh, really classical, uh, namely the Gaussian concentration. Uh, so in one of its formulations, not in the strongest one, uh, it says that if you have a function on uh, Rn, a real valued function, uh, which is uh, a Lipschitz with respect to the Euclid Euclidean uh, norm in, in Rn, and uh, if you have a Gaussian standard random vector in, uh, on that space on Rn, then you know uh, how a function f uh, deviates from its mean. I mean, you know, you know what are the what are the tails? You have a upper bound for the tails. It just says that uh, that these tails uh, decays exponentially fast, uh, roughly like uh, like the tail of the one-dimensional Gaussian distribution here, uh, properly normalized, namely with the variance L squared. Uh, well, let's take some some toy examples. The the first one is really actually. Uh, actually the trivial one, uh, namely the, the linear functional here. Everything is uh, really simple. Let's take this linear functional of the norm one. Then, uh, well, actually we know the distribution of, uh, of this function under our Gaussian vector exactly, namely this is standard, uh, one dimensional standard Gaussian. Uh, so we will also know, uh, we'll also know the tails. These are just, just Gaussian. And let's take something uh, a little bit less trivial, still simple, uh, namely function on uh, Rn given uh, as the Euclidean length of the of some <laughs> linear transformation of the vector x a is some some matrix, and this is a Lipschitz function with a Lipschitz constant, which is just the operator norm of of a operator as uh, uh, with respect to the to the Euclidean. Uh, Euclidean um, uh, metric on Rn. Okay, so well, a few words about the about the proofs of uh, of uh, Gaussian concentrations from. <laughs> okay, so it actually takes its roots uh, uh, from a Gaussian isoperimetric inequality, uh, which is like a much stronger statement. However, the the proof of it's it's more much more involved. So people were we're looking for for some simpler approaches to to if if one just want to obtain the the, the Gaussian concentration. <coughs> uh, so uh, well, this comp this list is by no means complete, uh, but let me just mention the, uh, the the nice and simple proof of of uh, Moray using stochastic calculus and Hito formula for Brown motion, and also. Uh, the functional inequalities approach, or the approach by with a uh, <coughs> semi-group uh, methods, uh, which uh, is due to Gross, Herbst, and, and many other people like Popkov, Ledu, and well, this list of, of names is also no, no, by no means complete. Just, uh, just for the record, the stochastic proof is already present in a paper by Ibrahimov, Sudakov, and Sirenson. Okay. On seventy-five. Okay. <coughs> okay, so let's stick to the to this last uh, approach. Uh, well, so uh, uh, we'll need the notion of uh, entropy of uh, of a non-negative random variable, and uh, let us recall the what we mean by logarithmic Sobolev inequality. We'll we'll say that. Uh, a random vector in Rn satisfies the logarithmic Sobolev inequality with some constant L if the following uh, functional inequality is uh, is satisfied for all smooth functions uh, f uh, defined on Rn. Uh, 
So, uh, well, what are the classical well-known facts, uh, now well-known facts about about these inequalities, uh, namely, well, the standard Gaussian measure in Rn satisfies this inequality with constant one. Uh, well, this is somehow the reason for, for this factor two here. Uh, and uh, also, well, due to, uh, by argument due to Herbst, uh, we know that if uh, if a uh, random vector x satisfies the, the logarithmic Sobolev inequality, it also satisfies the Gaussian concentration. Namely, if we have a one Lipschitz, say one Lipschitz function on Rn, uh, then the, 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 concentra the, the concentration in this sense uh, is, is satisfied. So, well, what the, the way that the Herbst argument roughly, roughly goes is uh, uh, you want to apply logarithmic Sobolev inequalities for inequality for this family of functions. Uh, which uh, well gives you some um, differential inequality and then some Grunewald type lemma uh, gives you some uh, estimate for a Laplace transform of uh, of a function f, uh, which by Trebuchet's inequality turns turns uh, to 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 this um, tail inequality. Okay, but we'll uh, we'll take somewhat uh, a different route um, instead of uh, deriving the con concentration directly from from logarithmic Sobolev inequality. Let's uh, let's see what it does. Uh, the logarithmic Sobolev inequality I implies. So uh, well, this is uh, the argument that uh, uh, first appeared explicitly, I guess, in the paper of Ada and Str Struck in '94, which. Uh, says that, well, whenever uh, vector x in Rn satisfies the logarithmic Sobolev inequality, it satisfies the, the following uh, Sobolev type inequality, let's say, uh, namely here for also uh, arbitrary smooth function f, the growth of the p -th, l, -p l -p -th norm of f uh, minus its mean is controlled by by uh, LP norm of, of the len Euclidean length of the gradients of uh, of f. He, uh, no, 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 no. You know it's the, you know the moments. No, 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 but no, 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 but it's not uh, not equivalent. The logarithmic Sobolev inequality is is, is stronger. Uh, well, actually, in uh, in the context of a uh, Gaussian measure, Gaussian random vectors uh, in Rn, this uh, inequality was uh, actually known for some time already. Uh, it appeared in the in the work of uh, Pizier from uh, eighty eighty six, uh, and it has a pretty short, elegant proof. Uh, uh, and also very uh, very elementary, which you can, it's like a half page or so. Uh, well, uh, and from well, in what follows, we will, uh, we will use the following equivalent form of, uh, of this uh, inequality star. Namely, let us introduce the, um, the standard Gaussian vector G in, uh, in Rn, which is independent of our main random vector X and rewrite the, the right-hand side of our inequality in the following, uh, in the following fashion. Uh, well, if we look at, at this expression uh, conditionally on x, namely if we fix uh, x, this is just a linear form in, in G. So, uh, well, we know for a fixed x, we know where, what, what the distribution it has. It's just a uh, one-dimensional normal with uh, with a variance which is uh, squared of the length of the of the gradient of f at at a fixed x. Uh, well, so we know the growth the, the the growth of the of the LP norms. This is roughly square root of p uh, as for Gaussians uh, times the the length of uh, times the square of the variance, which is 
here the land, Euclidean length of the of the gradient. So that's why this recast to to this right hand side, we just need to drop the, the square root of p and uh, up to the constant, it's uh, up to some universal constant, it's the same. Uh, well, so. Uh, so this inequality, or, 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 or in this formulation, is uh, well says something about uh, how we control the the LP norms of uh, f minus its mean. So how it relates to to the tails. Maybe let us let us uh, explain it briefly. Uh, well, so on the one side, it is just the Chebyshev's inequality. If you have a let's say, or some non-negative random variable, real value now, uh, let's think that uh, y is just the absolute value of f minus its mean. Uh, so then the Chebyshev's inequality gives you uh, the following estimate for the, for the tail. So now if you know the, the, if you have some good upper bound for, uh, for the LP norm of, uh, of uh, random variable y, you you have uh, you have a nice tail tail estimate for y. <laughs> well, so if you know that the rate of growth of the of the moments of y is uh, like square root of p, not faster than square root of p, you know that your the tails of y are are sub Gaussian, and if the growth is sublinear, then you know that your uh, your random variable is sub exponential. Okay, and in the other way around, uh, well, maybe not the other way around, but but uh, but the other the other bound, namely here, we, we from the upper bound for the for the for the moments, we have the upper bound for the for the tails, and uh, the reverse inequality we can we can we can get via so-called pale zygmunt inequality, namely if you have a lower bounds for the moments. And you know some something about the regularity of the growth of the of the moments, then then you have a lower bound for the for the tails. They believe. Well, now let's think that z uh, non-negative random variable is our y to the power p. So eventually, f minus its mean absolute value to the to the power p. Then, uh, well, the the Pauli Zygmunt inequality in its. Uh, 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 in its abstract form, it says 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 this. So this here here you will if uh, z is uh, y to the power p. This is a ratio between the LP norm of y and uh, mm, uh, norm of the order two p. So if you know if you know that this ratio is not too small, namely you have you know that the the moments behaves somewhat regularly, do not, cannot grow rapidly in, in uh, if you have uh, twice as, as big moment, it doesn't, does not, uh, doesn't grow um, suddenly, then, uh, then you will, you have uh, the following lower bound for the, for the tail. So now to, 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 to make it make the sense out of it, you know you have to know the some 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 good lower bound for the LP norm of, of Y. Okay, so let's see some some examples which goes beyond the, the, the Lipschitz case. Let's will all this still is somewhat classical. Namely, let's take the quadratic form in a, in a Gaussian vector, which we can represent this way as uh, uh, where A is some, uh, let's say, symmetric n times n uh, matrix with, let's take the zeros on diagonal to, to make uh, the zero mean. Well, uh, if you, so well, you can diagonalize A, namely find the um, orthogonal, or, orthogonal matrix Q, uh, which change the basis the, so that uh, in the new basis the matrix A is diagonal. Let's say it has uh, terms di on the diagonal form in the diagonal matrix D. Uh, well, and on uh, and the other ingredient is the fact that uh, Gaussian distribution is invariant under rotation. So if you apply the 
uh, orthogonal, orthogonal transformation to G, it, uh, the distribution stays the same. So, uh, so actually, this random variable and this one has the same has the same distribution. Uh, well, but uh, this now is just a sum of random variables gi squared with, uh, with some coefficients di. Uh, well, f sum of di's is zero because we had zeros on diagonal, so the trace stays zero. Uh, we can subtract once to make it, uh, well, now the sum of independent random variables which are, which are centered. Uh, and well, using some some classical tool, classical tools from from probability like uh, Bernstein inequalities for sums of independent sub-exponential random variables, uh, you get the uh, you get the tail of uh, of your random variable. Uh, namely, the tail is uh, well is in, within some range. The tail is sub-Gaussian, and uh, for ra larger t the farther tail is, is sub-exponential. And uh, the quantities that <coughs> comes into the game are, uh, well, the, the Euclidean length of the, of the vector d, of di's, uh, um, which, uh, well, it's uh, the same as the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the, of the initial matrix A, namely the square root, square root of the sum of the <coughs> squares of the, the entries of matrix A. And uh, the other quantity is, uh, is just the operator norm of, uh, of A. Uh, well, in terms of moments, this, this just says that the growth of the, of the LP norm of, uh, of, of this random variable is controlled from above by the square root of P times the, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm plus uh, P times the operator norm. The, by the way, the, the, the first one is, is, is always larger than, than, the, than the second norm and, and can, be, can be essentially larger, for, uh, especially in a large dimension. Uh, actually, well, for this example of, uh, of the quadratic form, this, uh, this inequality for moments or for, for the tails can be reversed up to the constants. So, so this... Uh, uh, so this upper estimate is in a sense, in a sense, tight. Can be, can be, can be up to the constants. Can be, can be reversed. Okay. So let's. Uh, well, this was about the quadratic forms. Let's now take uh, something even more complicated. I mean, uh, well, now we have a. Uh, we have a matrix A, which is actually multi-indexed matrix. We have a D indices. Think of, uh, well, previously D was two. Now you can think about D to be three, for example. And uh, let's uh, assume that this, uh, this multi-indexed matrix is symmetric in a sense that it's invariant under the permutation of uh, indices and has zeros on all diagonals, meaning that if two indices are the same, then the, the, the corresponding entry is zero. Uh, well, then uh, let's uh, take uh, the following function in a Gaussian random vector. Uh, well, you can here s think about A as a multilinear operator, and you just apply the same vector G, D times, well, which, uh, which is just just this uh, this sum over all uh, the indices ranging from one to let's say n. Um, this kind of object is is known in the literature as uh, Gaussian chaos. Actually, the tetrahedra of Gaussian chaos because all the uh, due to the the assumption that we have uh, zeros on all the diagonals, uh, there are no. Uh, G here, which is in uh, in uh, in power greater than one, so you cannot have squares or cubes or whatever. Uh, okay, and this is the result due to Rafael Latawa, which says uh, which provides the two-sided uh, estimates for the moments and tails of uh, such a tetrahedral Gaussian chaoses. Okay, so so as pre we previously saw on the previous slide, for d equal to two, it is somewhat simple because. Well, we can diagonalize things. The, the Gaussian distribution is invariant under under rotations, and here the things 
for uh, already for d equal to three, the things get uh, much more complicated. Uh, well, so what what are the estimates though? Okay, so there is a precise formula. I'm, I mean, up to the un, up to some universal constant. This is the same quantity from the from the above and from the below controls the the LP moment of uh, of such a Gaussian chaos, uh, and the rate of growth of the moment is. Is uh, is the following? There is some okay the the growth of the speed square root of p, linear in p and uh, p to the three uh, three half. Uh, well, and these norms. The first norm is uh, about uh, like a Hilbert Schmidt norm for this three linear operator. The last one is like the uh, the norm of uh, of the multilinear op of A is seen as a multilinear operator on L two n times L two n times L two n, and this is some some of the mixture of these two. Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess the result here is about the tightness. But if you apply decoupling inequalities, don't you get the same? <coughs> so if you apply decoupling, uh, you well. You end up with uh, applying the independent copies of the same vector to. Uh, so this is like a multilinear uh, version of the same question, and well, actually it's the same question now. And for d equal to three, it's 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 tough, right? Actually, uh, what Raphael did was well to to uh, to first apply decoupling and then to answer the decoupled version, right? And and this is okay. the decoupled version was. I mean, this was not prior to two thousand six. No, 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 no. For d equal to three, it was, it wasn't, right? And then higher. Uh, just one more question. Uh, so, uh, for, for, from moments to tails, is it just the standard Chebyshev and yeah. Zygmunt, or is there a different argument? Because you have to, you said he proves two-sided estimates on the, on the moments. Yeah, so if you have the estimate from below, which up to the constant matches the one from above, then uh, and uh, and also the, mo the the moments grow regularly, namely the, the twice as big moment is not much bigger than. Um, so then uh, the Pali Zygmunt uh, gives you the tail estimate from below, which also matches the uh, the the tail the upper tail estimate from Chebyshev, right? So this is so this I'm is. Still a little unclear. So I mean, there are these decoupling inequalities going back to the eighties. Yeah. Of Taku and, and yeah. so that doesn't apply here. Yeah, it does apply. You can you can uh, you, you you translate this problem to, to, to the decoupled one when you just uh, you have just multilinear. Uh, it's the first step of the I'm sorry. It is the first step of the algorithm. The hard work is coming. Up. Yeah, you, you you definitely prefer working with decoupled. The question, namely, you have having the the, the multilinear form in, in independent copies of Gaussian vector, right? Having like G uh, G1 uh, capital G1 up to capital GD, right? And then then you then you think what 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 to do. In still the decoupled question in in D equal to two is is easy. There are many ways you can do it uh, for similar reasons like like. For the quadratic forms, this is like a very similar thing, but but still for d equal to three or higher, it's it's tough. Why is it asymmetric? Yeah, eight, one, two, three. So well, so here it's it's a natural natural uh, assumption. Well, if it is not symmetric, then uh, uh, but has all zeros on diagonal, it's uh, well you can still make it symmetric, right? And and it doesn't change the function. You just take the average over all permutations. It, it doesn't change anything. Uh, and in the decoupled version of the question, the, the, the assumption neither of symmet symmetricity or, or having zeros on diagonal is not needed anymore. It's, it's not the relevant. Then. Okay, so so well, like the the Gaussian concentration, uh, we saw that well, the linear functionals uh, uh, have a known distribution. Linear functionals in, in Gaussian vector have are just one-dimensional Gaussians, and the thing is easy. Uh, and the Gaussian concentration allows you to to pass to to Lipschitz function, but but which are not not linear anymore. So in the same spirit, we want to drop. Uh, 
well motivated by by these previous examples like uh, Gaussian chaos or quadratic forms or delinear forms in Gaussian random vectors, we wanted to pass to something something nonlinear, and this is what our result is more or less about. So let's. Uh, well, the main assumption is uh, is this uh, Sobolev type inequality. Here you can you can think so the random vector x satisfies uh, this inequality. This is what we assume. Well, you can think that the x is, is standard Gaussian in Rn. Uh, okay, so what uh, what the result says is the following: If you have a well, in in the case of uh, order like two. Uh, so uh, we are going from from quadratic forms uh, to something not which is not quadratic or not bilinear. Uh, so let's uh, take the function f, which is uh, c2, uh, such that we have a following pointwise estimates for uh, second-order derivatives. Namely, we know how to globally estimate the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the second-order derivative, and the same about the operator norm by some some two quantities, uh, Hs and Hop. Uh, and then we have the following following uh, inequalities for the rate of growth of moments and for the tails uh, of uh, function f minus its mean. Uh, well, and uh, if we look at the, at the estimate for the, for the moments, uh, if f is the quadratic form as, as, as previously, uh, then well, these terms cancel out, and and what you what you end up with is the same as as, as previously. Namely, you have the growth of the order square root of p times times the Hilbert-Schmidt norm plus a linear growth in p uh, with the coefficient which is operator norm of uh, um, of the matrix that uh, that is associated with the with the quadratic form. Here, in the more general setting, what you what you additionally have is is this term, which is well, you take uh, you look for the gradient of, of your function on your space, and you take the average of of this gradient as a as a vector, and then you take the Euclidean length of of this average, and uh, this is the coefficient that comes. Uh, that pops up with uh, well with the rate of growth square root of square root of p, and well translating to to, to moments estimated, uh, it gives you the the following tail inequality. So you have the uh, you know that that your function is sub Gaussian within some range, and uh, and for larger t it's uh, sub exponential. Okay, so let me outline the proof because actually this is uh, like a simple trick. So well, so this is our uh, main assumption: this functional inequality of uh, Sobolev type, which is as as, as we explained, uh, no, it's known that it's implied, for example, by logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So definitely um, <coughs> satisfied by uh, <coughs> by Gaussian random vector. Well, so we we want to to look at it at in in this equivalent form where we drop the square root of p, but instead we take a scalar product uh, with, of the gradient of, uh, of our function with the independent standard random vector, uh, Gaussian random vector. Uh, x uh, can be whatever satisfies this inequality, but, uh, but g is an independent standard Gaussian in Rn. Well, so uh, then we apply this inequality to, to our function f for which we want to, to, to have this moment estimate. Uh, well, and uh, plus, some tri plus a triangle inequality for LP norm, namely what, uh, what we do here in, in comparison to this right-hand side, we just uh, subtract and uh, add this, uh, this function, this scalar product, and take its LP norm. Well, uh, so then we can translate it back, get rid of this Gaussian vector, and uh, the square root of p pop up, pops up. And, uh, well, here what, what happened is I just, for, for some convenience, I, I renamed the g to g bar. It's still independent Gaussian, independent from x. And, uh, well, what, uh, what happened else? Uh, I, I, we've pulled out this expectation outside the scalar product, so now we have to 
uh, integrate with respect to the to to x only, right? Okay, so now what uh, what we do? We deal with this with this first term that we have, and uh, conditionally on g bar, we use our functional main functional inequality main assumption once again. Uh, well, we use it to function h uh, given as a scalar product of grad of f, uh, scalar product with, with g bar. g bar is, is some fixed vector, right? It's, we, we do it conditionally on g bar. Well, and what, what we get is, uh, well, this term uh, we just uh, write, rewrite, and, and, and what we get is, uh, well, actually the right hand side of of this inequality it involves, well, we have to take a gradient of h. And what will happen if we take the, the gradient of h, we will end up with the second order derivative of, of f, to which we will apply, uh, again, an independent copy of, uh, of a Gauss standard Gaussian, which, which is uh, g again, right? So what, what is here? Conditionally on, on x is nothing but, uh, so if you fix x, it's nothing but, uh, but a bilinear form in, in uh, two independent standard Gaussian. So, well, uh, uh, we know what it is, it's uh, LP, LP norm, right? Well, previously we did it for, for quadratic forms, but for bilinear forms it's, it's the same. It's controlled by P times the operator norm and square root of p times times the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Well, so finally, if we have some global estimates for for this operator norm and Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the second order derivative, then then we are done. We can actually uh, replace this LP norm with L infinity norm if we have this additional information. And well, actually, that's 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 the trick. Uh, well, what happens if you uh, if you go into the Higher order, well, you can, you can, we can, we have the same result. Now your function is uh, d times differentiable, uh, and uh, well, actually, what you do, you do this trick d times. Uh, you iterate uh, this main assumption, this Sobolev inequality, d times or d minus one, and uh, well, and you will end up with. Uh, Tail estimates or the or the moment estimates that involves the well again uh, uh, the mean of the of the gradient then the mean of the second order derivative and so on and so on uh, actually well so these will be some some uh, deterministic quantities of which you will take well here it's it's just a vector so you as previously you will take just the Euclidean length. Here, this will be some deterministic matrix, which you will take the operator norm and Hilbert-Schmidt norm as the quantities involved in the estimates. Uh, for d equal to three, there will be there will be this uh, also this intermediate uh, norm as in uh, Raffaele Tawa's result, and uh, and in a higher order will this this norms at least the notation gets more complicated and and by the end of the day you, you when you reach the um, the the last degree of of differentiability. You, well, what you usually want to want to know is like uh, uh, some pointwise estimate for such norms of 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 the last derivative uh, of the highest order derivative of uh, of your function. Uh, well, so like in uh, Lipschitz uh, setting, you have you just differentiate once. And you want to know the, the point, the, the, the pointwise estimate for for the derivative, namely being uh, one Lipschitz is like knowing that, that your gradient everywhere does not in the length does not exceed one. Here, you you can drop drop it in in, in for the price of, of knowing something about uh, how the the gradient the, the, the and the higher derivatives behave in the in the mean. And knowing some, some uh, eventually some pointwise estimate for the high, highest order derivative. Okay, so here what what will pop up, uh, what you will what you will encounter is uh, is the problem of estimating the moments of uh, of multilinear forms in 
in, uh, in independent Gaussian random vectors. As in the, in the previous argument, we had uh, just the bilinear form, which is somewhat <coughs> easy. Well, so this, uh, this result is, in a sense, uh, optimal for the class of, if you take the, the polynomials as the class of the functions and, and, and the x to be a Gaussian, standard Gaussian random vector, this, this uh, result uh, turns out to be, to be optimal. Well, so let us, let me mention one, uh, one application. Um, to the to the random matrices, let's uh, consider the A to be a Wigner n times n Wigner matrix. Uh, well, which entries uh, satisfy logarithmic Sobolev inequality? You can think that the entries are Gaussian, standard Gaussian, for example, one dimensional and n zero one. Let's uh, uh, lambda one up to lambda n be uh, eigenvalues, and let's take some uh, r function on the real line, a smooth function and consider such a random variable z, uh, such a sum, which is in the theory is called a linear eigenvalue statistic. And uh, <coughs> the result of Bouillonet and Zetouni says that, uh, well, if the function f is Lipschitz, namely uh, f infinity, uh, L infinity norm of f prime is, is bounded, then you know that uh, that your random variable is is uh, sub Gaussian. Well, uh, what our in result implies is is uh, the following the following tail estimate in which uh, well it it resembles maybe a Bernstein type inequality somehow. Namely, you have a sub Gaussian regime and sub exponential one. Uh, but uh, here you do not have to 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 estimate that, uh, to 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 assume that uh, function f is Lipschitz. Uh, why? Well, here you have some milder norm involving the first order derivative of of f, uh, namely the the integral of f prime squared with respect to the semicircle law. Uh, well, there is some some error term coming from. To, 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 to issues actually. And uh, well, there is sub-exponential decay. Well, in, in, uh, in both these terms, uh, well, the price you pay for, for, for going beyond the, beyond the Lipschitz uh, test functions f is that you have to assume that uh, second order derivative is bounded. However, for large n, uh, when the dimension of the matrix grows, this uh, well, at least, at least for fixed function, this this term becomes uh, negligible, and and also this er the same about the this this error term. Uh, well, maybe let me skip that and uh, let maybe let me pass to the to the second part of the talk. Uh, well, so somewhat inspired with the, with the, with the result that I've already presented, uh, let us think what what can happen for more general distributions. Well, more general in in, in, in at least in one way, namely, uh, well, this assumption at least, uh, well, like our random vector satisfied logarithmic Sobolev inequality is quite quite restrictive. Uh, in a format, it was presented with uh, with a continuous gradient. It it rules out the discrete distributions, for example. Uh, well, so so let's see what happens if you have a uh, random vectors whose uh, coefficients are independent, which well is somewhat restricted, but quite quite common case, and uh, sub Gaussian. Uh, well, what we mean by uh, that the uh, random this y now is uh, just a one-dimensional random variable, and uh, we say that it's uh, sub-Gaussian with uh, uh, with a coefficient uh, given by by this number. Uh, if this infimum in, infimum is 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 finite. Uh, okay, so uh, so in this setting, we, we as I've said, we take the the random vector x with independent uh, sub-Gaussian random variables. Uh, 
And let's assume that all, all the sub-Gaussian coefficients of all our coordinates are bounded by some, 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 uh, some common uh, constant L. Uh, and well, now for, for the beginning, let's, let's uh, stick to the case of, uh, um, of degree two. Namely, here we will not have uh, arbitrary functions as, as previously, uh, but just uh, uh, multivariate polynomials and let's begin with the multivariate polynomial of degree 2 and uh, well what you can uh, what you can uh, get is the following estimate which is uh, well exactly matches the, the one we had previously for general function uh, f twice differentiable with some uh, uh, with some pointwise estimates for the for the norms of the last order derivative, highest order derivative, and uh, but here now the well we we relaxed somewhat the assumption for for the for the underlying distribution uh, for the price of of the s smaller class of the functions, namely polynomials only. Well, uh, if you allow the, if you want a higher degree polynomials, then uh, the estimates will involve norms uh, of the higher order uh, derivative of, the, of, of, of your polynomial. Uh, the, 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 the same norms are like, like we encountered uh, previously. Okay, so let's uh, maybe write down more precisely the, the, the result for degree three. We have a degree three polynomial uh, and then we have the, the following estimate for, for the moments. Uh, and well, here, if, if, again, as, as previously, is like expected, uh, we take the expected gradient and its length, expected uh, second order derivative and its Hilbert Schmidt and operator norm. For the third order derivative, since this is a polynomial of degree three, this is already, already some uh, some deterministic quantities, deterministic three linear form, and there is no, uh, uh, and it, uh, you can drop x or whatever. This is just a deterministic quantity. Uh, okay, and here, uh, let me maybe outline quickly the the, the proof for at least the tetrahedral case, uh, namely the case when your polynomial of uh, degree here of degree capital D which can be you can be general like two three or whatever three was on the previous slide in the in the formulation of the result uh, tetrahedral which means that uh, all the all the coordinates of our random vector X appears in the power at most at most one uh, Okay, so this case is somewhat simpler than the, than the general, and uh, that gives some idea, at least partially, what 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 the what the tools we we use. And here, are some uh, some additional tricks in this simple tetrahedral case works that do not want to work in the in the general case. So, well, what what you can uh, what you can do, you can write your multivariate polynomial just uh, well, just using the uh, just using the Tyler expansion. Uh, this is a finite expansion, of course, uh, and uh, well, since uh, our function is is a tetrahedral polynomial, then the expectation commutes with 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 this function, uh, because uh, well, these are two two things. The uh, the polynomial is tetrahedral. This is one thing, and the other is that that uh, that the coordinates are independent, right? And uh, well, the same about the derivatives because derivatives are again polynomials. Uh, well, so uh, so what you what you have here is just uh, here you have some multivariate polynomial. You apply it to uh, to the copies of uh, I mean to, to the same to the uh, you apply the same random uh, random uh, vector d times. Uh, well, so this is some tetrahedral chaos in, in uh, or tetrahedral multivariate polynomial in, uh, in this random vector. So what you do, you use decoupling inequalities to have it 
to have it decoupled, this is one thing, and the other is uh, symmetrization, which also helps. Uh, so what the coupling inequality and symmetrization technique does for you is that uh, the LP norms of, of these guys are comparable with LP norms of these. So you just translate your, your question into somewhat simpler, because then knowing that your uh, here x sub 1, x sub d are independent copies of the same of the same uh, of the initial random vector capital X, um, and now knowing that the coordinates are sub Gaussian, you can uh, somewhat easily compare um, uh, compare the norms of of these with the norms of of these where you have uh, you apply instead of applying the um, uh, the sub Gaussian random vectors to 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 this multi multivariate polynomial you you just apply uh, the uh, the gaussians uh, what pops up here is is this constant uh, l to the to the little d uh, l was uh, was uh, psi two coefficients measuring how uh, uh, how sub Gaussian the, the our random vector is. Okay, so you you end up with uh, with the problem of estimating the the moments of the of the of the Gaussian chaoses, which is which is the the result of uh, of Latau. How do you compare the Gaussian to the Gaussian? Well, uh, so actually this is like one dimensional uh, thing. Once you have it decoupled, uh, you it's it doesn't matter whether it's order d or one, because it goes by induction. And for order one, this is like you here, you will have uh, the sum of independent, uh, oh, well, here it's important that uh, x has uh, independent coordinates, right? So, so this will be a linear form in uh, symmetric independent random variables. And uh, you can just uh, uh, dominate the LP norm of, of these with uh, LP norm of, uh, uh, of the same uh, linear form in Gaussian. This is, uh, this is not difficult. And, because, and it's, it's just a statement about order one, actually, because then, because you are in the decoupled setting, it's, it's, it goes by induction. So speaking of induction, what if you condition, going to the very first line, what if you condition the first line in this line? Okay. So you, you have a nice structure, i1 less than i2 less than id. What if you organize your sum to sum over i sub d minus 1, and then you condition on... Uh, Instead of using the coupling, right? Uh, right. And then, well, you uh, have to use decoupling at some point. I'm thinking of the I think there's some decoupling inequality due to cup mm -hmm. where You use sort of... You, you look at... You, you condition and you decouple. Making sense? Uh, I mean, you, you have right i1 less than i2 less than i2. Yeah, I, I, I so see, but. You exploit that structure. Mm. You sum, then you can use induction. You sum over d minus 1 in this case. And in the deep dimension, you condition, you apply your. No, no, so for, for some reason, it, it doesn't want to work that, that way, at least directly, right? So it's. Well, you arrange the things in the way you want to condition, but uh, but then it's, I think it becomes messy and you lose the. I I, I think it, uh, it, does, it it will not work so so well. So uh, uh, well, it's it's uh, well somewhat more. It's better to 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 use decoupling at the start, I, I guess. Well, no, if you do it by induction, I mean, you make the induction hypothesis. Look, look at d but equals three. But this is tensor norms. Yeah, look at d equals three. So if you, if d equals three, if you, if you take out the third coordinate, you're now back in the two dimensions. <coughs> and you're in good shape. Mm, no, 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 no. Yes, it is. But if you do it twice, you will have to uh, estimate some operator norm or some matrix with, with correlated entries, which is, which is quite a difficult task. I'm sure it's hard. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh,
Okay, so so just to finish, let me let me let me show briefly um, application of of this uh, inequalities for polynomials in in, in sub Gaussian random variables. So here the sub Gaussian random variables will be uh, binary zero one random variables biased one, namely taking value one with probability p and zero with probability one minus p. So uh, well, so this will be about the problem of uh, counting. Uh, copies of a fixed uh, graph uh, H in, uh, in uh, G and P. Uh, so let's name uh, Y sub H the, the random variables that uh, counts this copy, counts the number of these copies. And well, uh, in this uh, field there is a question about, uh, um, about the deviation of, uh, of, uh, of such a random variable above, uh, above its mean. Uh, well, and it turns out that, uh, well, actually this problem is about uh, having the polynomial of degree of the number of edges in the, in the graph H of copies which one we want to count. Uh, in uh, polynomial of, of such a degree in, var in, in binary random, uh, random variables, multivariate polynom polynomial in binary random variables, and uh, well, these variables x i are independent, so we have a vector x uh, consisted of these independent coordinates, and each coordinate is sub Gaussian with this sub Gaussian coefficient. So p is, uh, is the probability of uh, this random variable x i binary random variable x i to, to attain value 1. Okay, and uh, well, it's, there is a pretty general result due to Janson, Leszkiewicz, and Ruczynski that gives the uh, upper and lower estimate for, for this probability, but uh, well, almost the, the, the upper meets the, the lower bound, uh, well, almost because up to the, this uh, logarithmic term in, in uh, 1 over p. Uh, well, so recently, DeMarco and uh, Chatterjee and uh, DeMarco and Kahn, in somewhat independently, last year they ca uh, came up with the, with a sharp lower bound. Sharp meaning the, this upper bound for the tail meets uh, known lower bound due to Janson, Leszkiewicz, and Ruczynski uh, for the case of the of the triangles or or cliques. And uh, actually, what our general result for, uh, for uh, polynomials in, uh, in uh, sub Gaussian, uh, independent sub Gaussian random variables can get is that, well, in some range of <laughs> parameters, namely, namely when p is sufficiently large, uh, then we, t we have the, the, the sharp estimate for the, uh, for the upper tail. Uh, in the case when uh, we count uh, the number of copies of the CK, which is the cycle of, of, uh, of length K. Uh, well, so what was this, this uh, application of our result to this problem involves is like you have to estimate uh, these, all the norms of, of, uh, of these uh, quantities. This actually, th these are deterministic, but you have to estimate all this, all this norms like Hilbert Schmidt and the operator and all these mixtures and uh, well this this actually can be carried out so uh, even these norms at the first glance might look horrible uh, in some specific situations like this one you can you can you can really compute something but uh, what uh, what we what we get does make sense only only for clicks even these things you can you can compute for any any fixed small graph h okay so I, I see only Bernoulli variables. Excuse me? So I see only Bernoulli variables. Sub Gaussian. So, sub Gaussian. Or sub Gaussian. Sub -Gaussian. Sub -Gaussian. Thank you. Okay, so, so that's, <coughs> that's all I want to say. Thank you. Was yours also two-sided estimate of the? No, 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 no. This uh, for the general function, which is just uh, well, you assume some some bounds on the 
on the highest order derivative, there is no hope that you can reverse it, uh, having uh, controlling only the the, the the norms of the derivatives, right? This is like in a Gaussian concentration in Lipschitz for Lipschitz functions, right? You can you cannot reverse it while controlling only the the, 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 the Lipschitz coefficient so of the function. In, in your but case, you were interested in proving uh, anti concentration, and we wouldn't have any results. No, no, no. So this, well, so so we are we are not trying to go this way. I mean, yeah, yeah. So so this is uh, not. Uh, yeah, this is even not trying to 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 go this way. Yeah. How does how do these results compare with the Kimbo? Well, um, okay. So in this discrete setting, as as was as I was uh, mentioning uh, mentioning uh, in the second part. Well, this is not directly comparable. Uh, I mean, they also uh, have similar quantities that measure the size of the function. Like we had here, like this uh, expected expectation of the derivatives, uh, but uh, we have a whole bunch of norms for them. Uh, their their uh, quantities are somewhat simpler, which well makes uh, the Probably the, um, you do not need too many too much effort to, to apply it in a in a per, in a specific case. But well, for example, in, in this in this, uh, but also their their inequalities are are uh, there are some parameters that you can play some other parameters. This is like a whole family of inequalities. For in our case, there is a concrete. I mean the the the. the the single formulation. I mean, you have a function or a polynomial and and, and sub Gaussian independent variables, and you have an equality. For them, there is some part that you can play. But uh, for example, for this problem of, of counting cycles, you do not you do not get uh, the optimal result as in our and as from our inequality, which which turns out to be uh, to 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 to. Um, we are being able to, to get the optimal result that is in some range of parameters of this graph G and P. So, but from there, you, 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 it seems you cannot, you cannot get it. So, This is this has some some other flavor actually. This is not about. Uh, a but it compares to the Gaussian curves, and for the Gaussian curves, you have data with the bounds. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the result is not like focusing on on on, on tail or moment estimates, right? This is more more soft. Well, here we have like some. Some hard inequalities there. I don't think we have low influences in, in many of the. I mean, it's completely regularity condition test on the board. So. Mm -hmm. And also, the tail is more difficult. The things uh, that are in our paper are sort of some very limits here, yeah. and more quantitative version. This is a completely. Uh, this is like large deviation, right? This is. Maybe a last one. Uh, is there a conjecture for the 
Bernstein type inequality for eigenvalue uh, for the statistics of the eigenvalue? Yeah, so, well, so what, what we got here is some, something not very satisfactory. As uh, uh, the coefficient controlling the, the Gaussian part is not a true variance uh, of, uh, uh, or there was this, uh, uh, this Sobolev type norm of uh, F prime, I mean the, the integral of F prime squared <coughs> with respect to the, to the um, semicircle law, and this is not, uh, even uh, in asymptotic sense, this is not the not true. Uh, limiting variance for uh, for for the for the linear eigenvalue statistics. So this is not the right quantity that, that we get. This is somewhat well maybe uh, actually the, the 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 limiting variance that is that is known due to the central limits theorem for for uh, for linear eigenvalue statistics. Uh, and this is quite a complicated uh, expression, and well, what we have is some somewhat resembles it, but but it's not exactly exactly this. And but we do not know what should be what should be there uh, exactly. If we can, if we want to have the Bernstein type inequality for for a fixed dimension, we, we still don't know what what should be there. And, but we we actually do not do not hope that. This kind of simple approach can can tackle this problem. I think one should one should one should do something more smarter than that. Okay. So thanks again. <laughs> and, uh, we have a